Welcome everybody here at uh, the Salle Henri Le Boeuf of Bozar. We are here, you are not, the second time that we organize Europe Day here in Brussels and the second time we have to miss you all. Um, this is the first part of uh, our program on the occasion of Europe Day. Um, and the first part is also the dearest for me, is the presentation of the May Day magazine, the second edition. We made one last year. We had to make one because we had to cancel all our events due to the pandemic. This year, we didn't have to make a magazine, but we wanted to do it because we liked it so much last time. And uh, we, are, we asked the same partners as last year, the people from Are We Europe, and our partners, Bertelsmann Foundation and Evans Foundation, to join forces and make uh, a magazine. And I present to you today, uh, Teresa O'Connell, who's the editor-in-chief, uh, of this uh, edition and Hannah Torsiki, who is the phot photography editor. We will talk uh, about the magazine. First of all, I would like to say how we as Bozar, as a cultural institution, s look at this collaboration. We consider you, you have this, my colleague from Bozar Music who uses this stage much more than we do. They commission compositions from composers. They, they say, okay, you're an artist, you make a composition. We ask the same of you. Are We Europe is a professional collective specialized in making marvelous magazines and we say, okay, Teresa, uh, we want a magazine on the future of Europe. We give you themes, uh, the future of Europe. Will these 20s of the 21st century be the roaring 20s like, the for, like in the previous century? And then we give it to you. Now, could you Tell us a bit more about the recipe you use, the, the, the methods you use to, to compile this magazine, to make this magazine possible. Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having us. We're uh, really excited to be here. Um, about how the magazine came about, I think the, the, the beauty of, of a magazine project is that it's uh, really uh, the result of the work of a lot of people. And uh, how it usually starts is, well, we received obviously a, a concept and a brief from, from Bozar, and we were very excited to try to interpret it also with the help of, of uh, people and journalists and storytellers and illustrators and photographers who perhaps we also haven't worked with before. So we put out a call for submissions and, um, and we received some really, really, really interesting uh, ideas and stories. And unfortunately, we couldn't, we couldn't pick uh, all of them, but... Um, you, but I think that you, we you sorry. narrowed down the concept or you interpreted the concept uh, of, let's say, the future of Europe. It has become, let's say, also a futuristic edition, which, which, and it has this dimension, this spooky dimension of the tarot cards. Could you explain that? Why did you do that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I think um, the idea behind the use of the tarots was that uh, there's some element about thinking about the future, which is necessarily uh, magical thinking in a way. It, uh, it's uh, speculation and um, we don't really know and we can't really predict uh, exactly what's going to happen in the future. So we thought it would be an interesting, uh, playful element to add to the magazine, also both visually and conceptually, to associate a tarot card uh, that our creative director, Eddie Stock, um, drew and sort of reinterpreting a classic tarot deck and then associating a card to each of the articles and each of the contributions in the magazine. And that kind of gives another level of, um, of interpretation. Is it, and is it also uh, a way to make it less, and it's a wrong word, but you understand, less arrogant and to say, it's also very audacious to say, I will predict the future. This is what's going to happen. 100%. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's absolutely also saying we are not taking ourselves too seriously. We want to be, we want to have a conversation and it's in, extremely important to have a conversation about the future, but we also don't have the uh, pretentiousness of saying, this is what it's gonna be. It, did it fit also in what Are We Europe is normally doing? You, 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 you call yourself a pan-European collective. Could you tell us a bit more about what you're doing? Uh, sure. Uh, I think actually Hannah might be able to uh, answer that question better than me because I've, I've been with Our Europe uh, now as an external collaborator for um, under, just under a year. Um, and you're absolutely right, it's a cross-border uh, collective of storytellers and um, across different uh, media, which I think makes for extremely interesting projects. And um, Yeah, Hannah, maybe um, to, to, to uh, cast the ball to you, 
uh, it's the um, it's the, the the main unique selling proposition of what you're doing is making magazines in in on paper. Uh, you're also a, a photo editor in photography. Things have become digital the last 20 years or maybe longer even. But you, can we say that? Print media are back and are back to stay, or uh, is that uh, wishful thinking from my part? Um, I, I would love to agree with you, <laughs> absolutely. No, I think that print media is really something special. Uh, before starting with RE Europe, I, I was very, very skeptical about it myself. But I think that really holding something in your hands and really experiencing it in this way brings a completely new element to it that brings in my opinion, a little more value as well to what you're reading. You really take it to heart as well as with the beautiful design that we're doing and the stories that we commission. They really try to uh, push the boundaries, I think, a little bit in right. terms of what we think about okay. things. Uh, Teresa, if you could pick two articles in the magazine that you would say to present the magazine to the audience uh, and give them an, a, a clue of what it's like, what, which articles would you choose? It's an extremely difficult task to uh, pick uh, just two out of uh, what I think is really uh, an extremely solid uh, collection of, of pieces that we have in the magazine, uh, and I think they're all uh, as good as each other. Um, but I think one that I'm particularly fond of uh, that I worked on with the author quite closely was uh, a shorter piece about living in, a, in, a, in the Soviet uh, Khrushchev. I hope I'm saying that right. And that was... It's, um, the, uh, it's the, the social housing system of uh, the big uh, apartment blocks exactly. in the Soviet era. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, and uh, uh, the author of this article is, uh, I think, 19, and he is from the Ukraine. And he uh, pitched his story, but it, w it wasn't so... Um, it wasn't a, a, a sort of formed, a fully formed pitch, and I and I suggested to him, let's work on this together and see if it works. And then it, it worked, so it's now in there. And I think it's a really uh, a great opportunity to to be working on a project like this, to be able to also include the voice of somebody who is just starting out. And to me, that means a lot. And I think it also reflects the the ethos of Bozar and and also of our Europe to to make these things happen. And uh, to me, that was very special too. And the second one? And the second one, well, I, I'm also very fond of this one, actually. Um, <laughs> and not just because it's on the screen now. Um, but this uh, is about multilingualism in Europe. And uh, I think, I think, well, language is just a topic that I'm fascinated by. And, and It's um, a story about the biggest building in Luxembourg, isn't it? Uh, where the, the, the translators of Europe are working. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not sure if it's the biggest uh, building in Brussels, but it's... No, in uh, Luxembourg. Sorry, in, in uh, Luxembourg. But it's, uh, it's the biggest translation center in the world, and uh, it's the translation center of the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the author kind of uses that um, model of, of, of communication uh, and translation and, and interpretation between different languages, as perhaps he suggested, it could it could be a, a blueprint for other uh, other fields. It's a bit the question: Do we need one language in Europe to unify, or can we? Is it just the the, the value of Europe or the the surplus of Europe that we everybody can speak his own language? That's a bit the the question. It's, uh, I think that's absolutely fascinating because at the same we we you know we're, we're still very much caught up in this in this um, a struggle or, or, or kind of, uh, I don't want to say it's conflict, but anyway, we have this identity as, as European, or many of us identify as Europeans, and then at the same time we also identify, mm -hmm. or at least partly so, as in my case, Italian, British, Irish, um, and no. uh, uh, <laughs> Calabrian, the no. region where I grew up, you know. No. So, uh, uh, so there's this interesting, um, this interesting intersection, I think, at the minute, where we're on the one side, we we all uh, we all identify as 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 the same, but also we are all quite jealous and, and sort of uh, um, conservative, also of, of what defines our identity vis-à-vis mm -hmm. uh, -vis, uh, other people. And I think I think that the language question is interesting, in, in also in that way. So, do we uh, do we want to just communicate all in one language and then obviously that would make things easier but it also would really cancel out a lot of the things that make Europe or the world interesting which is uh, diversity, complexity, oh. history and culture. Oh. Okay Hannah, 
there were three photo essays in the magazine. Uh, one about the past, one about the future, and one about the present, if I can say that in general terms. Uh, you can talk about three, all three of them, but we don't. We have limited time. If you can take one out of it that, that, that maybe is exemplary for the, for the magazine, can you, is it? I was worried you were going to ask me this yeah. question. Um, I was thinking about it. I actually think the one that is a little bit how I see the future, uh, which is the one by Bego Anton, and the one on sort of spirituality as well as alternative life practices mm -hmm. within Iceland is how I suppose I could describe mm -hmm. it in a nutshell. And I think it's nice because a lot of people see this, uh, see people practicing things differently in life as um, strange or otherworldly, mm -hmm. when in reality, you know, these people are very, very tied to nature and this is just In their Iceland, way they of don't living. throw rocks in the sky. That's, you, can you explain? It's about, it's, it's, it's a wonderful yes, song. Yes, I don't remember where this quote exactly was from, but it's this uh, idea that um, there's sort of mystical creatures and things living Floating within the, the nature. Yeah. yeah, so of course, if you throw something, you might hurt someone. Um, <laughs> you need to be considerate, of course, of your surroundings, and I think that's a very nice mentality to bring forward when looking okay. at the future of Europe. Okay. Uh, I would, uh, we will continue our talk uh, with some of the, one of the journalists who, who collaborated at the, on the magazine. Um, because, and maybe that's, give me the opportunity to talk about uh, the diversity of the, of the magazine. We have um, uh, journalistic stories, we have essays, we, but we also have photos, and we have a uh, graphic uh, story, which is what I'm hinting at now, and we also have poetry in the magazine. So, um, Teresa Hanna would like to talk to thank you very much for being here, and uh, stay stay here to listen to uh, Carolina Secha, who is our graphic reporter. So, graphic reporting, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we uh, cherish uh, it, in Mayday magazine in our first edition. We uh, also uh, had a wonderful piece by Judith van Istendal, who um, um, we asked her to, to, to write and draw a story on the, uh, the pandemic, the first lockdown, and um, that was what she did. And now for this second edition, we asked uh, Karolina Secha, who is, she was born in Poland, lives in Brussels since she was the age of six, and uh, now she's working here on the graphic novels, but we asked her to creep into the skin of a, a journalist and try to tell something about what it's about to live in uh, Brussels and to uh, be Polish. Because in Poland, of course, we in the West, Western European countries, and I say we, I hope a lot of people from outside of the Western Europe are watching this, we always look at, um, we have tendency to look at, with a lot of prejudice, towards these Eastern European countries, all the, or, uh, and it's, uh, Carolina was well placed to talk about her position as with the Polish roots here in the capital of, uh, of uh, the European Union in Brussels and how it is to live here and be here uh, together. Uh, so Carolina, you've settled down. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome here in uh, Bozar. Um, you work not far from here in the Marx Lane Museum, or you used to work there, where you there is a sort of writer of or artist in residence program. Can you tell us something about it? What what do you do there? Of what do you, you and your colleagues do there? So in fact, it's a kind of a dream job <laughs> because <laughs> Great, yeah. I just have to come there, open the museum, the put the lines on, and I can draw. The whole day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and sometimes there are tourists or visitors that ask me questions, but um, normally it's very quiet and very cozy because we also got a very big, not big, but uh, a good space uh, where we can work on our projects. Um, we have everything we want. <laughs> so um, you, you, You're in fact you studied at uh, this, uh, in, you had your training here in Brussels. Um, Brussels is quite famous for its, its comic scene and Belgium in, in, in general. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come about 
uh, how did you uh, decide and when did you decide, okay, I will want to, to dedicate my life to, <laughs> to, 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 to comics and to, uh, um, to being a graphic storyteller? It was not a dream of me when I was a kid. Um, yeah. I just really liked to draw and I, I didn't like to study um, <laughs> at middle school and I always wanted to go to art school, but I couldn't. Yeah. So um, in the end, I really still wanted to go. I went to St. Lucas mm -hmm. and my first question was, in which direction do I get the most drawing hours? And it was uh, graphic storytelling. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, then I will start making comics. Mm -hmm. Um, so in fact, it was not planned, but I started to fall in love with the medium. Uh, and I remember that Judith van Istendal was also one of my first teachers mm -hmm. I got in contact with. And I felt a bit ashamed that I didn't read before, like I didn't know an, a lot about comics. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, you know, I also prefer to make them instead of read them. And that <laughs> made me okay. at ease. <laughs> uh, um, you have published your first uh, album, I must say, yes. uh, last year or two years ago uh, In already? October 2020. Can you tell us something about it? It's, it's, uh, it's a fiction story, I, I presume? No, it's, uh, well, it, it is fiction, but uh, it's based on my, uh, the story of my dad. Mm. When he turned 50 years old, he started to have like his late midlife crisis and he like, uh, yeah, started to have big ideas. And I just found, uh, it was just the inspiration for me yeah. to make something about it. When uh, Teresa from Mayday Magazine asked you to uh, make this story about um, um, yeah, yours, as a journalist, in fact, because it's, 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 it's much more uh, close to reality than, than what usually comic artists or graphic storytellers do. Did you feel comfortable with that? Uh, for journalists, journalists don't invent stuff. They yeah. just write or draw what they see and hear. Yeah. I was really, um, I would not say I felt uncomfortable, but I, I wasn't sure if I could do that. Like if, if what I would tell would con be considered as a journalism, because I'm, like I said, with my story of my dad, uh, it's something personal that happened, mm -hmm. it's real, but you place the things on, like in the other, um, Order, order, yeah. order yeah. or you, you kind of try to uh, glue things together that yeah. did not necessarily happen one after yeah. the other. So is that considered uh, journalism? I don't know. Um, but I did try uh, to tell something that you cannot look up uh, because that for me would be like, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very personal story. It's about your family living in Poland and you living here. And in Poland, there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of uh, unrest, I must say. We always look from there, oh, what's going wrong in Poland? Yeah. Uh, and you're in contact with the family, but you're also here in Brussels, not being also as a foreigner, uh, I must say. I'm, I'm sorry for the word. <laughs> uh, also, the title of your story is I'm not Belgian either. Could you explain a bit more what the, what, where the title comes from? Because that's, that's key for the understanding of your yeah, story. Um, so that is something I was thinking about uh, at a specific moment that I also used in my comic, um, in my graphic journalism, <laughs> uh, because it really happened and it made me think about who I am, who I am here in Brussels. And I think a lot of people that also um, moved to another country have the same thought, like, am I from here or am I from there? And um, I was at the tram station and um, somebody passed uh, before me and it was a black guy um, and he like pushed another person and that person get, got mad and he was like, oh, all those um, foreigners. foreigners, they should go back to their own country. And he looked at me with a smile like he was looking for a confirmation from another Belgian person, but I'm not Belgian either. And mm -hmm. that's how the title came. Mm -hmm. Uh, I felt very uncomfortable, uh, mm -hmm. like I, like this is not my home. Uh, uh, you're, you're a privi privileged witness to, to tell us something about Poland. Um, how, how do you uh, 
consider the situation in Poland now uh, for ordinary people or for people who are your age, but not, not from the big political st point yeah. of view, but we have the impression if we read the papers, and there's not a lot about Poland in our papers because we're all centered on our own country, mm -hmm. uh, but we always read things about discrimination, about racism, anti-Semitism, uh, anti-democratic measures. Mm -hmm. but, um, how, do you, do you, how does your family experience what's going on there? Yeah, so you would think uh, from an outsider perspective that Poland is still very conservative and very um, old-fashioned and very religious. And that is true, but I think people would be shocked to know how little, like that group of those conservative people that got little and it's getting even smaller. Because so the majority of Poland is much more... Yeah, they are open and yeah. I have my um, my family there that I, they go to all the protests and they really want to see um, Poland become more uh, European minded. Um, but yeah, Do you it's feel uncomfortable when people in Brussels or people who, don't, who are not from Poland are criticizing your homeland, your mother country? Uh, to be honest, I don't get in contact with those kind of people, so mm. I'm, I think I'm lucky. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm surrounded by good people. Okay. Uh, just a final question. What are you working on now? Uh, what can we expect from you in the future? Um, so I'm doing two projects. Um, the uh, at the Max Lehn Museum, I'm working on my second graphic novel, and it will be about my grandmother that is Polish, and I would like to show the three um, generations, like the my, like I live here with my mom and my grandmother. She is not very integrated in Belgium. My mother is between the two, and, and I. She lives here. She lives, yeah, in she lives here, and I'm the most integrated person. And I thought that that perspective would be interesting to show to like the outsider, like how is it to live um, with those three ge generations. Mm -hmm. um, and the second project I'm working on uh, is a uh, children's book uh, about diversity. Uh, and it's from the project of Sesam, Studio Sesam uh, in Antwerp. Okay. Carolina, thank you very much. I enjoyed your work uh, tremendously and I hope to see and read much more from you uh, in the future. Thank you. So uh, we come at the closing of this first uh, part of the program of uh, Europe Day. I just have to give the practical details. Mayday magazine, uh, can, you can order it uh, on our website. Uh, so www.bozar.be, but also on the website of uh, Are We Europe. Please uh, get your copy because they will uh, not be available for a long time. It will be a collector's item before they're even published. Thank you very much.